Hi, Peter. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Ah, that's a really nice background you got there. That's the book that we're going to be, we're going to be talking about, Trust Shattered, Cases of Government Betrayal. Ooh, that sounds really uh, cool. And ominous. Ominous a bit too, yes. And we're going to talk about other books that you've written in the past. Now, before we do that, though, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you live, and what you've done, and how you got to this point where you now you're writing books. Well, my name is Peter Serafine. I live in central Pennsylvania little tiny town that nobody's ever heard of. It's called Belfont, meaning beautiful fountain, um, right outside of Penn State or State College where Penn State resides. So a little reference for more people to recognize. I, I'm a high school educated, just kind of average guy. I spend a majority of my life in the restaurant business. I did a, a short stint in the U.S. Navy, followed by more restaurant business. And then eventually I got tired of management and I, and now I'm a mailman. And how I got to writing was, was uh, right about sometime during President Obama's second term in office, I started to look around the political spectrum and think, man, the world's going a little crazy. I should probably do something about it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not famous. I'm not rich. I, I didn't really know what I could do. And then I realized, hey, there's all these self-publishing things out there. Now, like anybody can write a book. So I wrote a short book. It was, it was, a, it was called Progress, really. Uh, one Man's View of Social Progress in America. And, I, and in that book, I just kind of looked back at social progress over my own lifetime and questioned at what point is progress not really progress anymore. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of lit a fire in me. I went on to do a radio show and write three more books now. And I, I, I do a weekly opinion article for Substack and I, uh, I, I, I'm building courses on the U S constitution because I think constitutional education is, is horribly lacking in our country. And I, I put a whole lot of time and effort in all this stuff now. You know, I follow the news as well. I, I'm here in Canada, and I've spent a lot of time in the States. I have friends down there. And I was under the impression that the United States citizens know their constitution quite well, a lot lot more than Canadians know theirs. No. I, I That may be true of those, you know, over the age of 50. Um, okay. Constitutional education is, is horribly lacking in our country, and it's not uncommon to have anybody say, you know, such and such is a constitutional right. And I'm like, well, where is it in the constitution? And they can't answer you. Right. I mean, there, there's a, a massive amount of people in the United States that think that abortion was a constitutional right. And they're like, well, no, it was never a constitutional right, but it's not in the constitution at all. It was, it was a right that was created out of whole cloth by the U S Supreme court in Roe v. Wade. So yes, it was a right that was granted to you, but it wasn't in the constitution. Mm -hmm. People, people are, American citizens are horribly misinformed about what is and is not constitutional. And, and I think personally, I, I've come to the conclusion that educating the public of not only, you know, the 4,500 words of the U S constitution, but also the original intent and meaning of those words is probably the best chance we have of, of long-term success of our republic okay so something that uh, progress really and your subsequent books which seem to be all about uh, politics how do you go about writing like that and remaining neutral or are you neutral I, i'm not neutral um i tried it, it toward the beginning i i don't i let be quite honest, when I wrote Progress, really, I didn't know where I stood on the political spectrum. I hadn't been a, a very political creature. And I wrote that just recognizing that something was wrong in, in the world. Then the, the second book, uh, So Simple Even a Politician Could Understand, by the time I was writing that, I realized I was pretty far on the right side of the spectrum, the conservative side of the political aisle. And then writing my third book, A More Tyrannical King, I think it was while writing that that I recognized that I am a constitutional originalist, which to most people, they don't even understand what I mean by that. And to some people, that means I'm, I'm uh, 
so far to the right that I'm about to fall off the cliff. But when I when I came to that realization that that I think that the Constitution is is not only why America was such a great country for so long, but also the only chance that we have of of remaining a great country. Uh, I, I I really dove in and did a lot of research and a lot of studying of of not only the Constitution but the Federalist Papers and the Anti Federalist Papers and the ratification debates for the U.S. Constitution to to find out what the the founders meant and and what they meant at that time, which is really the only thing that matters is the understanding of the words when they were written, not what we have today. I think of a, a piece of classic literature, Shakespeare or or Dumas or you know anybody, and 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 think of the words that they used and see if you apply today's meanings to those words, does the story still make sense? You, you can't do that. Um, the one I the one example I I use often, just because it makes people's feather uh, ruffles feathers and makes them stand on edge a little bit. Is uh, you know in the Three Musketeers, and there's there's several references to one of the gentlemen taking a bundle of faggots under the you know uh, taking a faggot under the arm and heading back to their apartment. Well, you know when it was written, it was a bundle of sticks. Like, absolutely, yes. But nobody refers to a bundle of sticks as a faggot anymore in today's world. The only way the word faggot is used today as a is a slur against gays. So if you take today's meaning and apply it to the 15th, 16th, or in the case of the Constitution, 18th century document, you're completely ruining the document. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do all the time with, with political documents. Well, wouldn't amendments be what keeps it modern and up to date? Sure. If we weren't so politically divided that we can't pass amendments anymore. Please, I'm a Canadian. I'm not sure when your last amendment was passed. Well, which, 1994. What? Okay, what was that? That was originally the First Amendment. It, it was uh, pr first presented in 1790 okay. and, and never got ratified. The free it was, speech one? No. The okay. free speech amendment is the current First Amendment, but in the original list of proposed amendments, it was number three. And this is something that almost no American knows. So... Part of why we have a Bill of Rights in America is some of the people, some of the founding fathers, James Madison, for example, the gentleman who, who wrote the Constitution. Now, he didn't author it, but he was the one who penned it. He was the one that wrote it down. He firmly believed that the Constitution itself limited government enough that a Bill of Rights wasn't necessary. But the anti-federalists and some of the, even the Federalists, like Jefferson, said, that, no, 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 no. You have to have a Bill of Rights saying that these rights are protected. So as, as a compromise, Madison promised that if they would ratify the Constitution, he, he would put forth a, a Bill of Rights. And he did, as promised. Go figure, a politician keeping their promise. He proposed 15 amendments. He gathered all of the suggested amendments from all the 13 original states boiled them down to 15 amendments, and he presented those to Congress, and Congress cut it, it, cut it down to, to, uh, cut it down to 12. And the 12 then went to the 13 states to be ratified. The first amendment wasn't ratified in 1791 with what we now know as the Bill of Rights. The second amendment has never been ratified. So the first amendment was Congress can't vote themselves raise. If they vote themselves a pay raise, it does not take effect until after the next election. That amendment was, was the first in the list. But when it didn't get ratified in 1791, in the early, late 1980s or early 1900s, or 1990s, a, a grad student found that amendment, did a, did a paper on it, and got a bad grade from his professor. Hmm. So he went to his professor, I'll show you. And he went out and represented that same amendment to the states that hadn't yet ratified it. He got that amendment ratified 240 years later. Wow. So every, uh, there's a lot of people that say, you know, the First Amendment is first because it's the most important. Well, no. 
it's first because it was the first one to get enough votes to pass. <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Well, it's pretty complex stuff, you know. It is. Yeah. Uh, there's a friend of mine in the United States when we try not to talk about politics, but finally he came out and, and he says he's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's a constitutionalist. That's me. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what that is exactly. If, if what, where, where does it fall in line with either one of those two parties or are you that considered independent? We, we, a lot of people would, would call us independent, believe it or not, there are, are five nationally recognized political parties in the United States. Okay. The Democrats and the Repu Republicans are the only two that ever get any press or acknowledgement. Yeah. But there's the Democrats, the Republicans, the independents, the green part, or I'm sorry, libertarians, oh, yeah. sure. green party. That's right. And yeah. then the constitution party, the constitution yeah. party was originally called the taxpayer party. And it sprung up in the late late 1980s early 1900s and later changed its name to the libertarian or to the uh, constitution party and actually the libertarians kind of sprung off of the constitution yeah, yeah. party i remember that in 2016 they actually uh got quite a few votes i mean very marginally small but but uh, enough to, to swing elections that's yeah. what a lot of people think you know well, if you vote for this guy you know if you vote for one of these third party candidates you're throwing your vote away well, one of the things I've been trying to tell people is, okay, well, I'm a constant, I'm registered to the constitution party, but when it comes election time, I can vote for the Democrat or the Republican or the Libertarian or whoever's on the ballot. Mm -hmm. What, what I think is, would be valuable to those of us who firmly believe in the constitution and the values of the constitution is if enough of us were to just change our party affiliation, then, you know, all of a sudden the Republicans and the Democrat numbers shrink. And then now this other party's numbers grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that would be tremendously valuable. And why I fell in love with the constitution party for, for a little hyper hyperbolic cliche of a phrase. But um, when I did some research, the constitution party was the only political party I've ever found that takes every bullet part every bullet point within their party platform and ties it back to a founding document, whether it's the constitution or the declaration of independence. Okay. So everything they believe they, they string directly back to the foundation of this country. Okay. All right. So in the second term of Obama is when you started thinking along these lines, when did you start practicing uh, in, in your vote? Uh, whether that is for the federal election or the midterms or anything. When did you start actually putting that into practice? Well, see, uh, I, it was probably the, the second term of Obama when I started to really think yeah. about these things. Um, shortly around the time that Trump got elected is when I, uh, I can't remember if I had started writing before that or after that, but my first book came out with, in, in President Trump's first term. Mm -hmm. Um I, I voted third party. I did not vote for, for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton in yeah. 2016. I was afraid of Donald Trump, and I I just, Hillary is just a horribly unlikable human being. I know. And Donald Trump scared me. He was, you know, bombastic and and, and hyperbolic in his speech and, and just not yeah. presidential in demeanor, and, and that frightened me a little bit. So I ended up voting for... Uh, for the libertarian candidate, Gary Johnson. That's right. I remember him. Yeah. Who was a, a, a known marijuana user. And my logic in voting for him was, well, at least a pothead's never started a war. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. Well, and there's, of course, Marianne Williamson. She's back in the race for some reason. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. A lot of people it, are uh, talking about... Uh, RFK Jr., Robert. Pepper oh yes, that, that fellow. Interesting. I, I think RFK Jr. might be the Donald Trump of the Democratic Party. I I think Donald Trump was this populist candidate who his followers and the movement that he created is kind of taking over the Republican Party. I I think RFK Jr. has has the uh, potential to do that with the Democrat Party. Well, my, my only objection, and I'm not going to name names, I, I have a, I have two very close friends. We started a band in 1979. We went to about uh, 1984. We broke up. We rejoined again in the 90s. 
we are really close, three people. I vote the NDP, which is furthest left here in Canada. Uh, the drummer is, uh, he votes, um, he votes liberal, which is kind of centrist, and the bass player is hard right. And yet we all get along and we could have right. disagreements. And I think that's really healthy. What I really object to is uh, just hyperbolic nonsense that is is debunked easily. Uh, conspiracy theories play, in my opinion, play no role in politics. Yeah, well, you're, you're right on all fronts there. Um, it's very healthy for people of opposing political views to be friends. My best friend is a, he's an Iraqi and actually born in Canada, um, has an Iraqi father mm -hmm. and lives here in the middle of Pennsylvania. And um, until recently, he was one of the most liberal progressive people I knew. However, he's, he's becoming more and more conservative as time goes on. Yeah. Um, we get together and we'll have a whiskey and sit around a campfire and argue with each other and have have good fun and make fun of each other's opinions and points of view and try to debunk each other's arguments but at the end of the night it's like okay love you man see you tomorrow and, yeah. and that's the way it should be oh I, I really long for that again because it's it's missing and it's it's putting a bitter taste in people's mouths and i don't like that well, and I, I have a theory about that, and I can't take credit for this theory. This theory okay. comes from uh, from Brent Hamachek, actually, the gentleman who wrote the foreword of my new book, Trust Shatter. Um, most people are single-issue voters or maybe two-issue voters. They have one or two things that are supremely important in their lives, and they will vote for that one or two things, regardless of what party that is. But what they realize is that, um, let's say it's, let's say it's a physical conservative, a physical conservative here in the United States might always vote Republican, but they might have the most socially proje pro progressive uh, ideals in their own heart. They might believe everything else about the Democratic Party, but the one or two things that are most important to them is over here in the Republican Party. And they develop a team mentality. And they start to champion everything about their team, which they've chosen based on that one or two issues. So, for example, if I'm a fiscal conservative and I vote Republican because I think they've got a better chance of, of uh, cutting the budget and getting us out of debt, well, I might also start to believe their opinions on, you know, border security or, or uh, prison reform or, or whatever the case may be. I, I will start to champion their ideals, even though they may or may not be something I've ever thought about ever. And once we start to divide ourselves into teams, well, teams, when you're part of a team, you want to win. And, and that is just fueling this this horrible divide that's going on in our country i did i have to say that i put a lot of effort into to to the new book trust shattered i put a, a whole lot of effort to avoid any conspiracy theories in this book and i also tried really hard to write it in such a way that if somebody who's in on my political team to continue the team analogy reads this book maybe they'll learn a thing or two that they didn't know but if somebody's on the other team reads this book i i really tried to write it in a way that they won't be offended i see that they might read it and go well i still don't agree with peter but at least now i understand where peter's coming from right that took a lot of effort it, actually it doesn't sound like a big effort to not include conspiracy theories it doesn't it doesn't, but you can be accused of a conspiracy theory when you're stating things that you know are fact. That right, or... right. Um, yeah, if, we go back to, if we go back to 9-11, there's some people who believe that it was an inside job. Let's just, yeah. let's just forget about that. But when America decided that going to Iraq was the thing to do, there were voices who said, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. It's not going to end well. Would that have been considered a conspiracy theory back in 2002 when this was, you know, you know, being cooked up? What was the conspiracy theory? Was it was it Colin Powell with a yellow cake or was it the people saying, no, this doesn't make sense going to Iraq? 
example of the, the conspiracy, I, I can't think of a specific for that one, but if you want to go all the way back to Saddam Hussein and the the accusations of ma- uh, weapons of mass destruction. Right. Yeah. Well, there's conspiracy theories out there that says that our government knew that there were no rep- weapons of mass destruction from the beginning. We just said that so that we had an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. But generally speaking, we don't know the outcomes of conspiracy theories for somewhere between 20 and 50 years later. So yeah. maybe maybe the government did know or maybe the government didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> but yeah, one of the right. One one of the stories in my book is um, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. Are you familiar with those? No, I'm not. Okay, so in 1923, the United States government, I, I, official narrative first, conspiracy side that is not in the book. The official narrative is in 1923, the United States government health department, I forget what it was called back then, but they identified 600 black men from Tuskegee, Alabama, who all had syphilis and studied how syphilis progressed. The conspiracy part of it is there's a lot of people out there that believe that the government went out and gave 600 men syphilis so that they could study the effects. Mm. I wasn't around in 1923. The government has never admitted to giving anybody syphilis. So I didn't conclude that, or I did not include that in the book. I spoke about, they went out and they found these 600 guys. They studied them. And oh, by the way, 10 years later, when it became common knowledge that penicillin cured syphilis, they didn't give it to them. They kept studying them. Okay. And if any of these guys decided that they didn't want to be in the study anymore, they were threatened with lawsuits. They were offered bribes, you know, free food, free transportation, free health care, whatever they could do to get these 600 men to stay in this study. All the while, these guys have probably given syphilis to their spouses passed it along to their children through their spouses and then for another 40 years studied them while their brains rotted in their heads all the while knowing that penicillin was a cure Mm -hmm. all the while knowing that they were violating the basic tenets of informed consent in the nuremberg code yeah (laughs) and that's something that our government did I don't so, need the conspiracy to make that a horrible story. That's right. So it you, you, is you, a horrible story. Right, of course. And your byline there says cases of government betrayal. Is that what you meant by that? Yeah, that's exactly what the entire book is. It's about okay. 45 examples where our government, the United States government, has failed to protect the lives, the lives, the liberties, or the fortune, life, liberty, and fortune um, of, of American citizens, life, liberty, or property of American citizens. Yeah. According to the Declaration of Independence, that's the purpose of government, to secure our rights. You know, we hold well, the truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed mm-hmm. by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the suit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments how, are instituted among however, men. However, however, wasn't that written at a time when they were slavery and they weren't thinking about all men now were they they weren't but that's that's one thing that has changed over the time and we have uh, we have had amendments to the constitution to yes, of course yeah of course yeah but so, an amendment is one thing changing the minds of people is another thing altogether right but the declaration of independence uh, states that the purpose of government is to protect the lives liberties and properties of their citizens i agree and my book is a collection of 45 examples divided into those three categories, life, liberty, and property, where government not only didn't protect them, they have been the active attacker of those things. Well, your, your country is not the only one who's done that. Canada has done that, too. We have some dirty secrets as well, which came out uh, a few years ago. So yeah, I, I remember some people of here. Yeah, for sure, of course. It's just but, part uh, of uh, it was part of taking over this continent and just uh, moving people who were here before just aside and say this is ours now. It, it, it started off on a bad foot. I mean, Canada and the United States and uh, Central that's America. That's true, but every know. every inch of land on this con- on on this world has been conquered over <laughs> and over and over again. Yeah, taking over the North American continent was no different than any other inch of land. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. 
Yeah. The only difference there was was the uh, was the technological adv- advantages. There was there was a big big disparity in in technology between mm-hmm. those in North America and those coming from Europe. But it's not the first time that's happened. Mm-hmm. The Mongols took over most of the world because they they had invented the recurve bow and they could shoot a bow and arrow from horseback. Yep, that's right. I come from Hungary, and uh, so my mother kept talking about that, in, you know, a thousand years ago, whenever that took place. But yeah, for sure. Right, and then the crossbow came along, and wow, you mm-hmm. can shoot a crossbow a lot faster than you could shoot a longbow. Mm-hmm. And then gunpowder, but well, originally, gunpowder wasn't a big wasn't as big a thing as as we think it was because the bow and arrow and the crossbow were still far more effective than the musket mm-hmm. until they got better. Well, back to your book, Trust Shattered, you told one story in there. I, I, I take it that it's, of course, it's nonfiction, and you tell a number, you give how many, 20 some odd examples? 45. 45. 45. And in each case, you have a little story uh, behind it. Is, is each of these examples a, a chapter of, a, of their own? Yes. Each um, each example is its own chapter. Um, like I said, it's, a, it's divided into three parts, betrayed bodies, betrayed liberties, and yeah. betrayed uh, estates. Okay. And uh, yeah, how is it being received? Well, I, it's not even out for general well, public that's, sale that's yet. Right. It, okay, okay. Um, but by the time this airs, it'll be out, so we'll find yes. out then. Yeah. We'll so have, it's have uh, we're on. recording on on April seventeenth. It comes out in about two weeks, May first. Okay. Um, pre sales are going pretty well, actually. Just got a notification on my phone right as we sat down to record this of a of a new pre sale. Okay. Um, I've got a sign one and get it in the mail tomorrow Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but but uh, i i've done about 20 you know about two dozen interviews and and the hosts are always interested in what i have to say and they think it's a a great idea and like i said it really is i i wrote this i didn't just write it to reaffirm those that have my political beliefs i really wrote it in in a way that you can give it to your political opposite and and say you know let's for example i'm i'm against universal health care that's run by the government so if i find a friend or family member who thinks that government run health care is a brilliant idea i might give them this book and say okay read part 1 it's about a third of this book it's about human experimentation that was done by our government lies told to us by our government all in violation of international law and then tell me that after a hundred years of examples that you trust your government to make your health care decisions and that's why i wrote it i really I sit and I think I can't believe that anybody would would trust government ever. I don't understand why anybody would trust any government in any country at any point in history. So whenever I find somebody who has this belief that government's going to swoop in and fix whatever problem, I I can't I can't understand why anybody has that faith. So I wrote the book as to how can you know all of these things? And still have that faith in government. Well, okay. Uh, remember, I'm Canadian here, and I, I don't really necessarily have faith in government. But when I had my brain aneurysm, and I was in ICU for 37 days, and I had, I think, four or five MRIs, and when they discharged me, and when I got better, I didn't have a bill. But I looked back on my life as at 60 when my career ended, and I realized I paid a hell of a lot of taxes in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I got my money's worth. I didn't think about the government for a second. I thought about doctors and nurses and how good they were when they took care of me. Uh, uh, That's just just me. But but there was a report that just came out recently ranking um, healthcare, universal healthcare in all of the Western countries, and Canada was ranked dead last in the list. Yeah, it could be better. Absolutely could be better. We spend a lot of money in taxes, and, and I agree, it could be better. Yeah, well, yours is yours is one of the most expensive, and it came out last in the list. Well, that's just like American education. It's yeah. the most expensive in the world, but we keep falling down the list in the rankings. Yeah. Hmm. Well, they're thinking over here, I should not thinking, they are going to be implementing it in July of 2024, starting with people my age, 65 and over, 
uh, we apply. And if we fall below a certain income, which being that I'm on just basic pension, uh, dental care will be covered by uh, the uh, health insurance. Now, I'm grateful for that, but I do question, where's that money coming from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody pays for it. Yeah. Well, you're right. You paid for it your whole life. I did, but I'm my taxes are so little now. You know, I don't make much money, so I guess the young people are paying for my teeth. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. Okay, so that's that book. If you want to talk more about that book, we'll we'll put it on a shelf for now, and okay. we'll get to it at the end before we sign off. Uh, what's uh, what's another book of yours that we can talk about? Which, what would you like to talk about? I'm I'm proud of um, so simple. Even a politician can understand. Great title. Uh, Simple Ideas for Seemingly Complex Political Issues. Um, this book was recently recognized by Book Authority as uh, being listed as one of the best political books of all time. So I'm really excited. <laughs> I got cool. that. Really I, good. I, I would have been thrilled if it was one of the best books released the day that this was released. But the best, best of all time, to be on that list was, was very exciting. And, that and is uh, that's quite something. Like something and so what's it about it's a collection of ideas that i either i had myself or ideas that that came to me through guests of my radio show back when i had it that that are just really what it says simple ideas that would go a really long way to fixing a lot of the political problems in in the united states but most of these ideas are ideas that will never be seriously considered by government because they're too simple they can't bury, you know, pork projects, pork spending project and pet projects in them. And they can't, they can't turn it into a 40,000 page uh, omnibus. <laughs> it's something simple that uh, uh, American immigration is a huge topic right now. Sure. They, there has been this, this thing out there. It's a computer system called E-Verify. Been around for decades. What E-Verify does is if you, as an employer, want to hire somebody, you get their uh, appropriate documentation. You go to the E-Verify website, you put in the information on these things, and the E-Verify system tells you whether or not that person is legally allowed to work in the United States. It's a great system. Um, I used it as a, a manager for a couple of different restaurant chains, and once we actually caught we got a flag and we couldn't hire somebody because they were using a stolen social security number. But E-Verify would eliminate the ability, if, if it was mandated, if every business in the country, if every employer in our country had to use the E-Verify system, it would make it nearly impossible for somebody who is in this country illegally to find gainful employment. Okay. And if an Ill illegal alien can't find employment, a big part of the incentive to illegally immigrate goes away Yeah. without having to fight over border security. Mm -hmm. So this is a simple solution that's been around for literally decades, but they won't mandate it because they want the fight. Well, yeah. I mean, there's things like that, the Johnson Amendment, uh, that it's not mandated. I mean, it's, it's not practiced, and yet it's there. So I find that kind of odd. I don't know that one. The Johnson Amendment? Yeah, I don't know what you mean. Yeah. So anyway, um, just as, a, as an example. So, you know, sometimes laws are just not uh, followed, uh, and they're not being, you know, being t dealt with seriously. But Right. Uh, well, what about um, infra something as simple as fixing infrastructure? It doesn't matter what country you're from. We have infrastructure. We have roads and bridges. They need to be regularly fixed. What's the big deal with arguing over whether that should be done or not? It's not so much arguing over whether it should be done or not in the United States. It's arguing who should pay for it. Right. According to the United States Constitution, the federal government has the authority over post roads, meaning post office roads. And that's it. The rest of it is supposed to be done by the states. The state, okay. Yeah. So the whole idea, the problem I have with, with the current federal taxation system is that the federal government reaches into my paycheck and takes 
a significant portion of my paycheck away before I ever see it. They give it up to this federal agency called the IRS that has tens of thousands of employees that they all have to pay. Mm -hmm. Then the IRS turns that money over to the, you know, the Federal Reserve or the, tre the Treasury Department, turns that money over to the Treasury Department, who has another however many employees that all have to get paid. Then the Treasury Department, when, when instructed by Congress, more people that were paying, decides where that money should be spent, then the Treasury Department gives it to those people. A third of the budgets of state and local governments in, in the United States, on average, about a third of the budgets is, is from federal grants. So think about that dollar that they took out of my wallet and they sent to right. the IRS over to the Treasury, to the Congress, down to the state government, and then down into my local government. Why didn't my local government just take it? Yeah. How much bureaucracy would have been eliminated and how much expense and cost would have been unnecessary? You know, how much of my dollar is left after it goes through all those levels of bureaucracy? Well, perhaps our countries are too big. You look over, look over at Europe and it's just made up of many different countries. But if you know history and if you look back on it, it's the borders have shifted back and forth. And every time that that happens, there's blood on those borders. So our countries may in the future, hundreds of years from now, be actually several countries. Maybe well, it's not maybe it's not working as a giant country. Yeah. I mean, and if you you look at Russia, for example. Yeah. The biggest landmass country on the on the planet, their border has shifted many, many times over the years. I, yeah. I just Ukraine. I mean, what we now know as as the Russian people, well, they came from Kiev. They mm -hmm. came from Ukraine. Yeah, well, I know that well. I'm Hungarian. Yeah, Ukraine yeah. has been part of Russia, independent, part of Russia, independent, part of Russia, independent, countless times over the centuries. Yeah. Well, it it, it it's um, it's unfortunate people have to die when and things like that happen, but I guess aggression Definitely. just just works that way. Mm. So we covered two books now, or. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one that's really neat. Uh, where is it, that one? A more tyrannical king. How the federal government has been more has has become more oppressive than King George. Wow, that's quite a statement. Yeah. Uh, well, the idea of this book was to go and and to to look at uh, individual issues and compare the government of King George, circa 1775 to the government of the United States today and figure out which one is more oppressive. And of course the subtitle gives that away. Yeah. Sometimes I think that, you know, we're born into the time that we're born and we know what we know. And even if we do look in, uh, in history and perhaps read some books, it, we just don't know fully. We don't feel fully like what it was like. So you write this book to try and, give an honest comparison between King George and the current administration, um, whatever it may be, you know, in this time period, 21st century uh, America. And and what did you discover and how did you go about finding those answers? Um, well, what I discovered is government is government. Government, it, whether it's a monarchy or a parliament or a Congress or a republic, a democracy, it doesn't matter. Government is government. And government will always grow. Government will always seek more power. Government will always limit the rights of its citizens. And there are, I've always said that government at some point, even the most strictly limited government, at some point, government becomes its own living thing. And it no longer is equal to the sum of its parts. It's greater than the sum of its parts. And and becomes an all-consuming presence. Mm -hmm. And in the in the example of King George, you know, the the colonists expected a a a a, a pretty substantial amount of autonomy from the king because he was three thousand miles away, and they didn't get to vote on the rules and the laws. And I think they had a reasonable expectation for some autonomy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. 
but then we come to you know this new government that was established here and we we set it up in such a way that we had that autonomy and we put these limits on our federal government so that it couldn't ever be like king george but it is because government is government if if the citizens of any nation become complacent or become happy and content and they're not mindful and watchful of their government their government will continue to grow and will continue to you know eat out their subsistence and and starve them of both liberty and sustenance if they're not careful so then is classical anarchy the answer no no on honestly i believe that the the government established by the u.s constitution limited to the uh, 17 powers of article 1 section 8 of the u.s constitution is about as close to a perfect man-made government that we can come up with the way it's designed is the federal government is supposed to have these 17 things that it is you know in control of and everything else is left up to the states okay and if there's a problem between the states and then the federal government gets to help mediate those problems. Okay. But what we have now is we have a a Congress, which according to the Constitution, Article, Article 1, Section 1, Paragraph 1, Sentence, were like the first freaking words <laughs> of the Constitution. All legislative power shall be vested in a Congress. But our Congress over the last hundred years keeps creating these agencies that end up being executive yeah. branch agencies who then write regulations yeah. that have the force of law. Well, that means Congress is basically delegating lawmaking authority to a co-equal branch of government. Okay. That's a violation of the separation of powers. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that they can delegate that power at all. And delegating it to an executive branch agency is clearly not what our founders intended. And if we stop doing things like that, if we if we go back to the to the Republican layers built into the Constitution, and we go back to the strict separation of powers between the executive, the judicial, and and the legislative. If we go, if we honestly go back to the original intent of the U.S. Constitution, I think we have a chance of surviving and 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 creating a thriving nation again. But the moment we do, let's pretend, you know, hypothetically, let's let's do a, instead of a dystopian future, let's say that let's say that the the Constitution wins, okay. and a whole bunch of people like me, we we rise up and we make enough noise and we start electing the right people and you know. Over the, over the next couple of decades, we, we managed to rein in our federal government back to its constitutional limits. Well, what's going to happen after that? People are going to be happy. They're going to be, you know, they're going to have more money again. They're going to be like, woo, yay, things are great. And then stop paying attention. It's human nature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, that doesn't take into consideration what other countries may do and cause uh, us, the United States and Canada as well, to step in and have to protect ourselves. I mean, things happen that beyond oh, yeah. our control. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes those situations actually bring people together, unfortunately, even though, you know, lives are lost and wars break out and whatever. Hmm, interesting. But those, those situations are often used as an excuse to violate. Mm -hmm. Our, our rights as well. I mean, famously here in the United States, um, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, which is oh. the right to, uh, to, to, it means bring the charges. Like you can't be just held in, in, in jail forever. Right, you, right. You, you have the right to say, no, 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 tell me what I'm charged with. Yeah. Um, well, the Constitution gives that, that authority to, to Congress, not to the president. So when Abraham Lincoln did it as president, it was a violation of the Constitution. Well, that's okay. um, also, you know, this this during the Second World War, when um, President uh, President Roosevelt, uh, uh, you know, interned four hundred thousand um, American citizens just because they happened to be of Japanese descent. Yeah. Like yeah. we we often use 
horrible, horrible things going on in the world as excuses to violate rights. I mean, to some extent, we've done it in Canada twice since I've been alive. During the FLQ crisis, uh, you know, Pierre Trudeau called the war measure, called for the War Measures Act, and now we have a much more sanitized name for it. I forget what it is, but uh, Justin Trudeau called for it a couple of years ago when things got out of hand in Ottawa with the protesters there, and gave power to the authorities to arrest right. people. Yeah, right. when they when they started arresting people and seizing the bank accounts of the truckers and that's right. And, yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Hmm. Um. No, it's, here, it's never a good look. You know, it's never a no, good look. You know, you know yeah. here we had we had uh nine eleven, which of which you know was was a terrible, terrible attack on American soil, yeah. which was unheard of to Americans. And then all of a sudden, really swiftly, poof, we put together this this Patriot Act thing. Because, you know, we've got to stop terrorism. But apparently nobody took the time to read it. Because it gives our it gives our federal law enforcement agencies all kinds of power that they didn't have before. Yeah. And it has been turned against us as citizens repeatedly. Huh. There's now this provision that, okay, so the U.S. Constitution, uh, the Fourth Amendment says that you, you were, were protected against unreasonable searches and seizures and that, that we are secure in our person's papers and, and effects. But according to this Patriot Act thing, my private information that once it's turned over to an independent third party, well, now they don't even need a warrant. So That's my, right. my cell phone data, my location data, my bank account data, anything that is held by some other, con some other company, the government has free access to it without needing a warrant signed by a judge. Right, right, yeah. Okay, Peter, what I'd like to do before we wrap up is sure. I'd like to give the floor to you. I mean, you've said a lot of things and... Uh... But this is specifically for you to sell your latest book, Trust Shattered. I mean, it's a sort of pitch. Give us your best pitch so that people will be convinced to order your book. Well, I All right. should have prepared a, a little, you know, elevator pitch, as they say. Oh, I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> well, I, I've gone out and I've become a, a Patriot Academy Constitution coach. And I have become an instructor for the Institute on the Constitution. And I, I've done a lot of research, and I really think that the Constitution is our answer. And I wrote this, this most recent book, Trust Shattered, Cases of Government Betrayal, because I don't think government should ever be trusted. Just like our founding fathers in the United States, they didn't trust government, and I don't think we should either. And I really think that we haven't held government accountable for their actions. Most of the things in this book, most of the 45 examples where our government has attacked, not just failed to protect, but has attacked our lives, liberties, and property, are things that we don't find out about until 20, 30 years later. And by then, we be like, eh, well, and we never hold them accountable. We, the people, the citizens of not only the United States, but every country in the world. We need to know our rights. As John Jay said, it is the duty of every citizen to read and study the constitution of their country so that they know their rights, so that they can better perceive when their rights are being violated, and to teach their children to recognize those rights. The rising generation, to teach the rising generation to be free. Obviously not a direct quote. The, the quote is in the book, though. Um, hmm. We have to open our eyes to what our government is doing to us from the lens of it's their duty to protect our rights. Is it nice when they can provide services for us? Sure. But not at the expense of protecting our rights. So mm -hmm. that's, that's my... Uh, I guess that's my pitch. Trust Shattered is the name of the book. Trust Shattered Cases of Government Betrayal. By the time this airs, um, it will be available on uh, Amazon and all of your favorite bookstores. Um, it's all, I also recorded the audiobook myself. So it's ebook, audiobook, paperback, and hardcover. Well, you got the voice for it, sir. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. You're quite the mailman. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Peter. 
And I look forward to seeing you again when you write another book. You look me up and we'll have this conversation all over again. I will. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. You take care of yourself now. Have a good night. Thank you for watching. If you like what I do here on Tell Me About Your Book, then please consider hitting that like button and leaving a comment. You can also subscribe and ring that bell because I release two episodes per week, one on Wednesdays and one on Saturdays. And if you are an author, I would love to hear from you. Until such time, keep on writing and be kind to one another.